morning. My name is Ahmad Harb, and I am the Director of Research at Arab Center, Washington, D.C. Welcome to this virtual briefing on Tunisian affairs and politics, uh, titled Political Ranking in Tunisia, the Democratization Process a Decade After the Arab Spring. Just as the title makes evident, uh, Tunisia is going through some really difficult times after almost a decade of its Arab Spring and transition to democracy. Disputes, ideological and personal, uh, between different political factions in its 217 member uh, parliament, uh, the failure of last year's elections to produce a dominant political faction that controls the majority there, and disagreements about the political role of its speaker, Rashid Ghannoushi, who is the uh, leader of the Islamist Nahda party, uh, are only some of the troubles besetting that institution. The collapse of the last government uh, led by Elias Fakhfakh and the appointment of former interior minister, Hisham Shishi, affects the function of the executive branch, negatively actually affects it. These disagreements and the instability in the government have allowed President Qais Saeed to accumulate more presidential powers. Uh, not that he really wants more presidential powers, but he sees that the country needs decisive action. All this while Tunisia is worried about its uh, failed economy, its weakened economy, especially at this time of the coronavirus pandemic that has actually decimated its uh, tourist uh, industry. Uh, by the way, Tunisia today has probably about almost like 1,800 cases of uh, uh, COVID and uh, 52 deaths. Uh, with us today is a, a great panel of experts on Tunisia who will try to disentangle the political uh, picture of the country. Each will have about uh, 10 minutes, uh, eight to 10 minutes, uh, to discuss uh, her or his specific topic. Uh, uh, as for question and answer period, please submit your uh, questions to the panelists via the Q&A feature on the uh, Zoom uh, 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 screen that you have. Uh, you can also submit these questions uh, by, through uh, events at arabcenterdc.org. First, uh, let me just introduce the panelists briefly in the order in which they will uh, speak. Uh, 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 Larbi Sadiqi, Al Arabi Sadiqi, beautiful, beautiful name, is a mm -hmm. professor at uh, Qatar University and a non resident fellow at the uh, Brookings Institution in Doha. He will discuss some political developments in the country, obviously, and issues of human rights and Islamist democracy, uh, specifically probably talking about the role of a Nahda uh, movement. Uh, Daniel Bromberg uh, is an associate professor of government at Georgetown University and a non-resident senior fellow at Arab Center, Washington, DC. He will discuss the democratic transition process and issues of governance and the elections, identity politics and considerations, as well as polarization of the political system. Uh, Sarah Yerkes is a senior fellow in the Middle East program at the uh, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. She will uh, uh, talk about some lessons learned from Tunisia's transition, as well as some regional influences, <coughs> uh, the US policy towards Tunisia and some economic challenges. Uh, uh, Rauda bin Uthman is also a professor at the University of uh, Tunis, and she will discuss the domestic political conditions in the country with a look at civil society, uh, the inclusion of women and youth, and uh, governance reforms. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Sadiqi, the floor is yours. Actually, the mic is yours. Zoom is yours. Thank you. Thank you, indeed. It's really good to be in uh, good company. Thank you for um, inviting me. Um, the challenge when talking about Tunisia is, of course, uh, that uh, these events are unfolding. They're unfolding as we speak. <clears throat> and that is always difficult to pin down um, the um, analysis to a single um, dimension. Um, however, as, as um, many scholars have been uh, talking about the crisis of democracy, I guess uh, equally we can talk today about the crisis of democratization. Um, in place like Tunisia, we've got a uh, fledgling uh, process of uh, um, reform. So to begin with, um, 
one can talk about some kind of political paralysis, um, as Ahmed has uh, mentioned. And what are the what is the anatomy um, of that paralysis? What are the outlines that one can um, identify to um, deepen our understanding of that paralysis? So I guess really initially uh, there is a question of consolidation. Where is the Tunisian uh, consolidation heading? Um, and at the moment, it is really, it has reached some kind of uh, an impasse. Um, so you've got on the one hand, the major gains in terms of free and fair elections, rule of law, freedom of speech, and uh, democratic constitution. So that is really common ground. So to, when Tunisians um, sing the praise of their democracy, that's what they mention. Um, nonetheless, uh, today uh, you've got lots of uh, problems and people are doubting whether this consolidation can be deepened. And, uh, um, so there is definitely sharp crisis. This crisis is uh, multidimensional. It is economic, it's social, it's political, and I guess really it's systemic. Uh, so we don't really know whether uh, the, the system that Tunisians have uh, chosen, uh, semi-parliamentary, semi-presidential, will uh, deliver the goods uh, expected by uh, the public, especially the public that in 2011-14 and uh, 2019 uh, tended to endorse uh, by uh, voting. So what you have now, I guess we to go back to the analysis. What we have, we have first of all the wrangling uh, that's ongoing between the different political parties. Um, Nahda and Kalbtoum seem to be on one side, and on the other side, you've got, uh, I guess, really uh, Bakaya al Bakaya, which is really the the, uh, the leftover from uh, the uh, fragmented Tunis. Uh, so you've got uh, uh, many fronts. Uh, you've got has been part of the story, but um, has been shared, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of these are trying to, uh, I guess, really, in a way, uh, make sense of uh, um, the 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 current, uh, I guess, really, uh, race for um, containing uh, the crisis. And in the midst of all of this, what you have? You have unemployment, violence, you've got apathy, you've got illegal migration, which is like a huge, huge problem. You've got the widening gap between the haves and the have-nots. As we speak, Tunisia has got um, protests ongoing in the Kamu, in the uh, southern tip of Tunisia, Tatawin, Bidnin, et cetera, et cetera. And then you've got the uh, phosphates basin protests, which began in 2008, still ongoing, still alive, and nothing has been resolved at all. And that uh, has caused, of course, a um, huge problem you know, for uh, the economy. So gas, uh, petroleum, uh, phosphates are not basically uh, producing anything at all. And then you have, of course, uh, factors that obstruct the, uh, what we may call bargain politics in the country. Structural inequalities, uh, party fragmentation, polarization, personalization of politics that detracts from the development of the civic values and practices that complement the institution building of, the, of um, democratization. So really here, there is a challenge to identify urgent issues screaming for attention, poverty, regional inequality, and yet phrases that everyone repeats, but no one really knows how it will be resolved. But uh, increasing inequality, all exacerbated, of course, by COVID-19. And you know, the only thing that's certain at the moment is the uncertainty that's spreading, especially in the South, and the center. So really all of these together, left and attended um, as problems will continue to destabilize democratization in Tunisia. And that's really why I began by saying, 
you know, as in the West people have been uh, talking about the crisis of democracy, it is equally up to the age to talk about the crisis of democratization in uh, Tunisia. So these are challenges that loom large in the, uh, especially for the uh, Hisham Mishishi, uh, I guess really uh, administration, uh, as he seeks to form a new government, um, especially at a time when really there is like rising populism of uh, President Qais Saeed, as uh, Ahmed has mentioned correctly. <clears throat> so, I guess really what I want to say about Hisham um, Mshishi, you know, um, He's, he's appointed, obviously, you know, by uh, Kai Saeed. So Kai Saeed calls all of the shots, political shots. Uh, so really, this is what we call like uh, the president's government. Uh, and this is creating huge problems, you know, within uh, Tunisia. Okay. So the talk um, over the past three, four days has been for uh, what's being called a non-partisan government. So really, the, the government under Farfakh, the Asad Farfakh uh, was uh, basically a partisan type um, government. Um, today, the idea is non-partisan, um, more or less technocratic government. So really all eyes are on Mishishi to see who will make the cut to this government. And there's all kinds of rumors at the moment that even the chief of staff of President Qais is actually the one making the appointment making the appointments, including of the uh, appointed uh, prime minister. So the third such, remember, this is the third such lineup in seven months. And that is really, if it tells you anything, it tells you something about the state of stability in uh, Tunisia. So unsurprisingly, the Tunisian public does not seem to be enthusiastic about the state of affairs in the country. According to uh, Emerald, Emrid Consulting latest political barometer uh, poll for July. 70% of those surveyed see the economic situation as worsening. 37% are pessimistic. 59% are optimistic, down from 78 the month before. So really things are changing like very uh, rapidly about the country's future. At the same time, Parliamentary mayhem appears to have caught up with the Nahd. For the first time, Abir Musa's Free Distu Party tops the list of parties respondents say they will vote for in the next legis legislative elections at 29% in mid July, according to the Sigma uh, Conseil survey ahead of the Nahd. So that would be really just like a major uh, change you know, in the distribution of. Uh, total vote of the uh, voting public. Okay, so second at 24.1%. Uh, okay, so Musi herself comes in second behind current President Said in the same poll with 10% of respondents declaring they would vote for her as president. And what I say now, um, watch out for Musi. I think she's gonna be a very serious contender for in the next uh, presidential uh, elections. So it is difficult to draw firm conclusions from these polls. It's likely that only the next elections will stabilize the shifting, um, uh, <clears throat> will stabilize the uh, shifting balance of power between uh, the different political parties. However, with Mishish's plans to form party-less government, so party-less government, early legislative elections seem to be an increasingly likely scenario. Okay, so this will be one thing we've got you know, to watch out for in Tunisia. In this light, the polls numbers are indicative of general dis uh, dissatisfaction, disaffection by the electorate, which uh, with reigning parties that have failed to resolve deepening problems of socioeconomic exclusion, regional inequality, high unemployment, and mounting debt to international lenders in the wake of COVID-19. Really, really important to realize that in the past six months, Tunisia has accumulated close to $2 billion, you know, of international debt, just like, you know, to, to manage all of these uh, crises. Another has yet to regain its bearings after Ghanoushi, 
senior leader and a speaker of parliament, narrowly escaped a no confidence vote in the uh, parliament, in parliament on July 30. Okay, so this is really also another space to be watching. All and sundry are still reeling with the raging uh, debating on social media about the implications of the failed no confidence vote. Was it a victory for the revolution? and a blur to external meddling? Was it a betrayal of Qalb Tunis in favor of the Islamists? Was it a deal between unlikely revolutionary and counter-revolutionary allies gone awry? Was it only the first attempt to bring down Ghanoush? All this comes on the heels um, um, of head of government, Elias Fakh's resignation nearly three weeks ago, and the unraveling of the ruling coalition comprised of Al-Nahda, Tayyara Demokrati, Harakat Shab, Tahya Tunis, and a number of independents. So Tunisia's biggest test for its fledgling democracy is bargain politics. That is values and practices of negotiation and dialogue by political elites for the creation of shared spaces with the goal of governing smoothly and ensuring continuity in the country's institutions, bureaucracy, and the provision of goods. Okay, goods that the public still awaits. We haven't seen those goods at all. Okay. The end of politics, after all, especially democratic politics, is to solve people's problems. In this case, Tunisia's interrelated problems of poverty and employment, regional inequality, youth harqa, harqa you know, sort of the boat people that live in those schools, Tunisia almost on a daily, uh, um, daily uh, doctors and professors without jobs, dilapidated infrastructure and limited access to quality health care, which of course like, you know, have become uh, more obvious during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So problems have plagued um, the first government after the fall uh, 29 elections, formed by Habib Jumli, into DC's parliamentary term that went into recess just before Eid al-Adha holiday. Political pendulum in Tunisia oscillates between consensus and discord Okay, so this will be another takeaway from what's happening in, in Tunisia. Yeah, very, very serious, you know. Okay, Parliament appears cocooned in its own squabbles, oblivious to the everyday struggles and pride of Tunisians, aspiring to a life of dignity. Um, remember, you know, dignity, karama, etc. you know, the empty slogans. They seem to be at the moment. When you ask any Tunisian, that's what they tell you. Yeah, they have evaporated. So what are the things that underpin bargain politics in the country? This is like really a huge question. It's the puzzle. The puzzle that you know we ought you know, to um, try to seek to, to answer. What are the issues that are stuck in the public in public life? We seem to be witnessing, in my view, a corrosion or a trepidation in the democratization process. It may not reach the level of reversibility and I'm not saying it is reversible, but there is some stumbling in the democratic process. Okay, so the Tunisian political scene has not reached a state of bargain politics. So I'm trying you know, to answer the question about bargain politics. Reaching the state of delivering political and distributional goods, particularly to the countries impoverished. First, in the institutions of the state, there is a lack of clarity in terms of delineating authority in the three had a pillarized system divided among the president, the head of government, and the head of parliament. Who is it, you know, who is it who leads? You know, this is really a big question in, in the mind of, of uh, the Tunisian public. Each of the three presidents comes to office with his only male so far agenda with a great variation in skills, experiences, vision, etc., etc. They perpetually face off um, against each other, despite public statements to the contrary, stepping on each other's should or can the president be involved in local politics, for instance, or should, should or can the president of parliament express positions on foreign policy? That's been like controversial of late. Should Ranush talk about what's happening in, in Libya? Okay. Should or can the head of government use his COVID-19 decree powers to declare policies on taxes or uh, judiciary, and by appointing his ambassador to head, um, um, form to head and form second 
uh, government, um, the president, you know, as he's doing his own political balancing through his interpretation of the constitution, specifically Article 89. This is what we call an Arabic muazanat. Definitely, you know, there is like, you know, this this attempt, you know, sort of, you know, at creating a muazana TSEA, you know, against mostly another, you know, being like, you know, seems at the moment like this big, you know, problem between the two. I will finish with this. So I'm, this I'm, has, I'm sorry, yeah. So this has two, you know, I'll finish here. Two negative effects. It disfigures the political system, which is semi-parliamentary and not presidential. While political parties have no majority, the balance of power shifts towards the president. The, uh, I might mention this earlier. So Said has been invoking the maximum constitutional leeway to take charge and tip the system in his favor in what has now become a precedent of Hukumat al rais Okay, so it is as though the president has some kind of vendetta against political parties. These new balances he has created come at uh, the expense of political parties, almost downsizing them. And this is the second problem. For whatever reason, Tunisia's National Constituent Assembly kept a loophole in the 2014 constitution that allows the president to bypass electoral legitimacy. This is really a huge problem. So in this anti-partisan strategy for forming a government, Mishishi seems to be on the same page as Said. So the potential head of government was part of Said's inner clique of advisors that include former University of Sousse law colleagues, Nadia Kesha, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think I'll leave it here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Larvey. We uh, really appreciate it. Um, uh, uh, I am going to change uh, the, uh, the order of presentations a little bit. Uh, uh, Rauda bin Othman is with us now, and uh, uh, Rauda, please uh, go ahead. You have about eight minutes, eight to ten minutes. Um, thank you for this invitation. I've uh, um, joined you a little bit late, but I've enjoyed what uh, I have said, especially from Dr. Larbi uh, Sadiki. He is very knowledgeable about this topic. I would like really to relate to this discussion by talking about uh, the perception of uh, the Tunisians of all of this uh, democratic transition and uh, this new thing of democracy. You know, in 2011, I was in the streets knocking on the doors trying to talk to citizens about uh, elections and about uh, democracy. And I couldn't, although the word of course exists in Arabic, I couldn't really mention it to old people or to young people because it doesn't ring a bell. I cannot tell, for example, I remember this old lady when I knocked on her door and I told her, are you ready to go to vote on Sunday? And she said, what's happening on Sunday? And I said, we have elections, you know? She said, didn't Ben Ali take the elections with him? Because we used it to be taken into buses and we used it to queue for hours in order to vote. Only a, a, a few Tunisians were uh, granted a voting card before uh, 2011. So although people now are so happy to gain this political freedom and to uh, have these new words of elections and vote and politics into their um, everyday discourse and into their imaginary. Still, Tunisians are so much torn, especially when they are realize that democracy has this very high economic cost. We heard so many people in 2012 and 13 and 14 and up to the present complaining about the fact that uh, it is, uh, life is getting so expensive and democracy is, what's the benefit of democracy if they cannot secure food on the table of uh, uh, every day and every night for their children and family. So this, uh, we have heard so many people, a very big uh, wave of uh, people regretting the Ben Ali time just because the economy uh, has gone so uh, badly and especially the average citizen is no longer able uh, to make ends meet. 
The second wave is all of these young people who were there in the streets in 2011, in the streets in 2014. They uh, have uh, not uh, registered any form of classical political participation. They have invented their own way, but these young people are full of despair and especially they, uh, they don't trust any of the uh, political parties or politicians and they feel that unfortunately um, the uh, Tunisian revolution has just uh, increased their feeling of uh, um, uh, being uh, marginalized and especially of feeling that there is inequality and an equal share. To most of these young people, politics is dirty, politicians are just uh, making uh, fortunes, uh, it's full of corruption, and they cannot uh, trust uh, anything. If we take the example of the last uh, Elias El Farfer government, everybody knew in Tunisia that Elias El Farfer government was doomed to fail. Elias El Farfer is coming from a party that lost uh, most of its electoral. Uh, he did not. Uh, uh, I mean, he didn't win a lot of votes in the presidential election in 2014, and he wanted to um, install a discourse of anti-corruption while everybody, even if he is not guilty of corruption, it's very difficult to convince the Tunisian electorate that he's not. So any of these people, uh, any of these uh, politicians, whether they do, uh, declare that they are anti-corruption or not, they turn out uh, to uh, make more, more money or to use uh, this corruption and nepotism uh, for a reason uh, or another. Right now, generally, uh, we are witnessing a very delicate situation where we have a very popular president with no uh, party and especially uh, parliament uh, support whatsoever, and we have a fragmented uh, uh, parliament uh, that uh, unfortunately another has lost a lot of uh, uh, its uh, electoral base uh, for uh, different reasons and uh, people feel that there is absolutely no uh, way out of it although deep down somehow now Dr. Larbi Siddiqui just mentioned that there is this uh, uh, dream of, I think, I think, if I may uh, describe it, uh, uh, the dream of the savior, this one leader, political leader who would uh, save the country from this turmoil of uh, um, conflict, uh, of uh, inequality, and uh, of despair. I don't think that uh, President Qais Saeed is going to uh, gain the same votes if he goes for if he runs for um, office uh, soon. We all feel that we need strong political parties. Unfortunately, we seem to be unable to know how to um, uh, encourage this in a way or another. Unfortunately, young people uh, failed in organizing themselves in any political force, uh, although they are uh, uh, in all uh, different uh, civil society organizations. They are there whenever it is necessary. We seem to be still torn between this polarization, um, a secularist against Islamist, the modern against non-modern. Uh, we have crammed our political discourse with these uh, oppositions and uh, with these dichotomies that are not helping any of us. Uh, and especially we feel more and more people who would like to leave the country, who are going, who risk their lives. We have seen families, young mothers with their children, pregnant mother, uh, women uh, crossing the street and taking the risk of trying to find uh, a better life somewhere in the world, but not necessarily Tunisia right now. It is so unfortunate that things have turned the way they are. Surely we are learning. We are learning how uh, to at least have build our own understanding of uh, political trans uh, democratic transition. We are trying to build a new um, culture, a new mechanism, but we seem to be so 
heavily tied to the past, especially this idea of the one strong party, of the uh, political uh, leader savior, of uh, uh, the fact that you can be modern only when you are anti-Islamists. So we have to work on so many of these uh, um, maybe wrong dichotomies, I don't know, but uh, uh, surely uh, we are not going to uh, see uh, the end uh, soon. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Rova, uh, for uh, a very succinct kind of uh, presentation. We really appreciate it. Uh, Daniel Bromberg, uh, it's yours. Well, I, you know, this has been such a, 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 a intense bath of pessimism so far. Yeah, I'm not sure that I can offer a much, make us, make us feel better, make us feel more, better. More hope, but, uh, and I'm not sure what I can add to what has already been seven, said, because so much of the ground has been so perfectly covered. I'll just add a few points uh, and, uh, and then hand it over to Sarah, because I think the discussion will be critical to our, to our meeting today. And that is everything that's been described so far, I think, is, is, is wholly accurate. The, the, the political system in Tunisia is a power sharing system, which essentially functions like a political ceasefire. Uh, people are close to one another, not because they trust one another, but because they distrust one another. So following the old adage, keeping your, your enemies close, this is a system in which everybody has to be around the table because they, they simply can't imagine being not around the table. They don't trust the actions. And this has been the way, in one form or the other, this is how it's been since 2014, and perhaps before. Um, and this is not uncharacteristic of uh, societies that have these very deep fr fragmentations and polarizations around social and identity and religious and ideological issues. And it's reflected in a political system, which is based on a, uh, on a proportional system, which recreates these divisions in the party. So you have this multiple party system, everybody around the table and everyone distrusting one another profoundly. But no one wants the, an alternative because they, they think it would be worse. Um, and this is sort of the, the, the picture that we've been living with from one form or the other. And it's a precarious picture. And I think it's important to tell, to, to state for our, our viewers, uh, what's at stake here? Because uh, we've talked about a crisis of democratization. In some sense, it's, it's a blessing that Tun Tunisia has a crisis of uh, democratization because the rest of the region has a crisis of autocracy or autocratization. This is the one case in, in, in the so-called Arab Spring and for which there was a formal uh, agreement to set the boundaries and, and terms of, of a democratic transition, a pact, as we call it in the business. Um, and uh, it, it held out a lot of promise. Um, but at the same time, uh, the pact put together this precarious formula, which is always about 15 minutes of, uh, to, to, to midnight in terms of its ability to, or half an hour towards midnight in terms of its ability to be sustained. If it doesn't, of course, the one example of a successful effort at the transition will, could, 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 have, could topple in one form or the other, although it's not clear how that happens in Tunisia, but it could. Um, and uh, if, it is, if the government is replaced by something that Professor Orthman was getting at, a, 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 a strong leader who tries to sort of rally the populace and perhaps the parliament behind uh, shifts that would sort of drag Tunisia slowly towards a more authoritarian kind of government, and this is not, I think, likely, but not improbable. Um, therefore, the, 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 the implicit coalition of governments and states in the region which prefer authoritarianism over democracy, and they have, of course include Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates, uh, and Bahrain as well, well, <laughs> you could easily see that coalition growing and the one hope for democracy in the heart of the Maghreb would, would, would collapse. So the stakes are, are, are very high for, for Tunisia, but also for the region, given particularly what's going on uh, next door in Libya, where you have a civil war and, and, and a government that is under constant, uh, an official government under constant threat by forces from within and from without. So the situation is, uh, is pretty grim and the stakes are, are very high. Um, and, and so uh, this, is, this is the situation and it is exacerbated by, as I said a moment ago, and I'll just say a few words about this because I do think it's important, the Libya situation and the sort of regionalization the international and regionalization of Libya's internal war has refracted back into, uh, into Tunisia. And uh, uh, Professor Sadiqi said, and I think he's quite right, that um, 
Hanushi, who's the Speaker of the Parliament and the head of the Islamists and the party, uh, probably played his hands very badly by uh, calling for what he calls a, a, a form uh, of, uh, of uh, neutrality, positive neutrality is the term he uses, that would in effect support the current government in, uh, in, in Libya. Now, whether you like this or not, this was viewed by both the president of Tunisia and uh, the enemies of Anakta as really uh, transgressing the limits of what Hanushi's uh, authority has and really um, undermining the authority of the president. And uh, the president said, nobody should step on my toes, essentially. He said that clearly this was directed towards Hanushi. Uh, and so Hanushi's missteps on the Libya crisis really provided Abir Musi and her uh, Disturian party a cause celebre, you know, to sort of really go after him and, and really sort of push this. And while they failed to bring him down in a vote of confidence, it was only by 10 votes or eight votes, it could happen again. So there's an unprecedented fragmentation and polarization of the, uh, of the political arena uh, in, uh, in Tunisia. And yes, there is growing uh, uh, hopes for within the young population for a strong leader, because from the vantage point of Tunisian young people, what's going on in Tunis is political theater. It has no impact on their daily lives. It doesn't address their economic crisis, exacerbated by the, the COVID situation. And so there is the rise of populism as ref refracted and reflected in the, the, uh, in the rise of the new president and his increasing what I call creeping presidentialism uh, is, a, is a function of the perception that, that politics as formal politics is quite irrelevant, if not just a fraud. Um, and so um, this, is, this means that the political system has really uh, lost even more ground in the last six months than before. And that's, that's a serious crisis. And I'll just finish here because I want to pass, pass the mic to Sarah and I want to have a discussion with our, with our, with our participants and viewers. And that is, you know, a good colleague of mine who's in Paris once said to me, how does Tunisia fall apart? And I'm not exactly sure how it does, because the, the one saving grace that Tunisia has, I suppose, above all, apart from the fact that I love it, I love the pluralism of the society, Tunisians love to argue and they, and they love to, to negotiate and both go hand in hand. But there is no third party arbiter, there is no military that solves anybody's problem. You can't do what they've done and what, what some folks have done in Egypt, and that is run back to the military for cover and for protection. So Tunisians are left to sort of sort this thing out themselves, which is a good thing. The question is now, given the paralysis of a parliament, which was never very functional to begin with, how do, how do they sort this out? They've already had a national dialogue. They tried that in 2014, that worked, but they can't recreate another national dialogue. I highly doubt it. So who's gonna be the, the arbiter of this struggle and how are we going to revive some faith in politics, formal politics and political systems in, in a system in which the vast majority of the, the, the parties, not all, but the vast majority are seen as quite irrelevant. Um, and so um, this is, I think, going to be a real a challenge for the country. And it's very hard to imagine who will step up to the plate other than, of course, uh, you know, the uh, Kais Saeed, but his He's taking advantage of a constitution which is deliberately blurred when it comes to who has ultimate power in terms of the president and the parliament. Um, and he's, a, he's, he's manipulating that blurry space to advance his, his, uh, his agenda and he is antagonistic. The president does not like the formal politics. He's already on record as saying he doesn't believe in parties. So what does he believe in? What does he want to create? And what is the alternative? There is no alternative to having some sort of institutional democratic system. Um, other than the one that I alluded to before, which is an effort to build and shift this country increasingly to a kind of uh, 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 electoral autocracy, as we call it in, in the business. And I'm not even sure that's possible. So it's, it's, it's a challenge and it's difficult to see how it will be met by the current leadership. And of course, the, the other question is how the, the neighboring regions, how the EU, how the United States, all of these, these, these countries in these, in, in, in these regions are all dealing with their own COVID crises and their own economic problems, how they engage with Tunisia to help it out of it, but it's a very deep hole. So I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you, Dan, uh, appreciate it. Um, uh, I just uh, would like to uh, just uh, say this to our uh, audience. We apologize for some technical issues uh, that emerged with, uh, with uh, video uh, from uh, 
uh, Larbi and Rauda, uh, we apologize uh, for, uh, for that. Uh, Sarah, it's yours. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So I think as we've heard from all of these uh, fabulous co-panelists, this is a critical period for Tunisia. And one reason is that we're coming up on the 10th anniversary of the revolution, which is going to be and already is this sort of flashing neon sign reminder that the goals of the revolution have not yet been met. We're also, as we've heard, in the midst of a government crisis and an economic crisis that was made worse by the COVID-19 outbreak. And as we've heard a little bit about, we're seeing Tunisia become more of a battleground for regional players. So I'm just gonna very briefly kind of talk through the status of the revolutionary goals and the main socioeconomic challenges today and look a little bit at regional influences and interests and then close with a few thoughts on US policy, particularly as the United States heads into the 2020 election. So first, looking at the status of the revolution, the three main goals, work, dignity, and freedom, have all been largely unmet. Uh, you know, when you look at work, this is kind of the most clear. Unemployment is worse than it was in 2010. And some estimates are putting, saying that unemployment is actually going to go above 20% due to an uptick from the pandemic. Looking at dignity, also, we've heard a little bit about this from Dr. Larby, but the post-revolutionary governments have really failed to adequately address regional marginalization. They failed to root out corruption, things that really drove people into the streets in 2010, 2011. You know, Tunisia has started a decentralization process that is meant to address some of this. That was started in May 2018. They passed the local authorities code and had the first ever democratic municipal elections. But according to the government's own estimates, their plan is a 27 year process, which it's you know, fabulous that this is planned out over 27 years, but there's very little that is being done in the short term to actually address some of this. So we're two years in now to this 27 year process, and it's very difficult to point to progress that has been made at empowering local actors or actually devolving power to the local level. The local municipal councils really are under resourced. They don't have enough money to do what they need to do. They don't have the right training. They don't have the right people to do what they need to do. So if you're talking about pushing people to wait 27 years to actually feel the effects of decentralization, most people don't have that kind of patience. And one of the more serious problems that's also been alluded to already is that the southern and the interior regions that had been intentionally marginalized under Borghi ben, ben Ali remain marginalized. And we saw this really become exacerbated during the COVID-19 outbreak, where more than half of the governorates in Tunisia did not have ICU beds. That's one very small statistic. There's a lot more that I could point to showing that there is this tremendous divide in just quality of life amongst the coastal areas and the interior in the south. And as was already mentioned, we see this marginalization still play out in the Khmer protests that have been ongoing in the south. You know, and this is despite in a 2017 agreement by the government, three years ago, the government agreed to provide jobs and resources to the Khmer region, and they have not delivered. So people rightly are angry. They wanna see the, this thing that the government has agreed to actually come to fruition, and they have not seen that yet. And then finally, looking at freedom of the three goals. You know, freedom is the area where we can tell someone of a positive story. There's been a lot better progress than the other two areas. But we've heard over and over again today the tremendous challenges in the governance arena. And I think we see this clearly in the government formation that's taking place right now. You know, this, the government that just fell only lasted for five months. That's nothing. There's no time to get anything done. And this is a result of this growing polarization, the fracturing of parliament that's been alluded to. And you know, what we have today is no party with even more than a quarter of seats. So not only is it really hard to form any sort of lasting coalition with those kind of numbers, but it's nearly impossible to address the most difficult and most important reforms that are still needed to keep the country moving forward. I think it's important you know, that we remember that there's still no constitutional court in place. There needs to be these long-term structural economic reforms that are challenging to put forward in a normal circumstance. But when you have the sort of fractured precarious government that we've been discussing, it's really impossible to get anyone to agree to take the risks necessary to push forward on these reforms. And I just want to know, you know, despite some of this negativity, I do want to applaud Tunisia for the tremendous progress that it's made in the political sphere. And I think, you know, we see the constitution, democratic institutions, vibrant civil society. These are all things that are tremendous accomplishments, but I do want to be careful that we don't think the political work or the work in the goal of freedom is, is done because it's not, there's a lot that has to be done. 
turning towards uh, regional influences. So just very briefly, I think some of this has already been mentioned, but um, I just want to highlight a couple of the ways that Tunisia is kind of becoming more of a battleground for both global power competition, but also for regional power competition. And uh, we've heard a little bit about Libya. So I think we're, we're seeing this practically pay, play out in how Tunisia is choosing to respond to the conflict next door. A conflict that has a very real impact on Tunisia itself and the Tunisian people, particularly in the South. And what we've seen is this real kind of split between the people in Tunisia's political sphere that are siding with Turkey and Qatar, and this is mostly you know, what we've seen from Hanoushi, and then siding with the other side, UAE, Egypt, Saudi Arabia on the other, and that's where we've seen President Said. And so what we've seen is, you know, Hanoushi basically overstepping his role as Speaker of Parliament, wading into a foreign policy, which is clearly the purview of the presidency, according to the Constitution, visiting Turkey, consulting with Ankara, things that have really upset a lot of people in Tunisia, and has particularly has caused this rift with Said. You know, at the beginning, Said and Hanoushi maybe weren't friends, but they certainly weren't as antagonistic as they have become. And a large part of this is because of this sort of regionalization. The Tunisia has actually kind of remarkably stayed outside of most of the kind of regional infighting that we see in a lot of the other countries of the MENA region. But they are, this is starting to become a bigger issue, particularly because of Libya, again, because of Libya's direct relationship to Tunisia. But also, I think it's important to kind of note China's role in Tunisia. We're starting to see China take on a bigger role in Tunisia and across North Africa writ large. But, you know, U.S. and Europe are still the major economic and cultural players in Tunisia. But Tunisia is becoming closer to China and China is becoming closer to Tunisia in ways that I think are important to watch. So Tunisia formerly joined the Belt and Road Initiative, China's sort of flagship initiative in 2017. And we've seen both China and Tunisia throwing greater and greater interest in one another. It's not surprising, you know, Tunisia's location between the Middle East and Africa has allowed it to play a really sort of important role in the various Chinese bodies, such as the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, the China Arab States Cooperation Forum. It's able to sort of straddle this sort of role of the Middle East and the role of Africa in a way that's very helpful to China. And we saw both the former Prime Minister, Prime Minister Shahid and President Sebsi really court China to try to encourage more Chinese investment and more tourism in Tunisia. And the tourism numbers prior to COVID-19 had really picked up. We were starting to see sort of exponential growth in Chinese tourism in Tunisia, which is great for Tunisia's economy. Um, we don't, we haven't really seen much of how Said is approaching China. Uh, so again, I think this is something just to kind of pay attention to and be aware of. And then finally, just a couple thoughts on US policy. You know, I think, you know, what we're seeing is a obviously a very interesting point point of U.S. Um, politics, given that we're getting closer and closer to the 2020 election. But all that to say, I'm not I don't really expect to see much of a change in U.S. policy toward Tunisia, regardless of whether President Trump wins a second term or we see a Biden Harris administration. What we have today is really strong bipartisan support for Tunisia and the United States. You know, there's really no one out there who doesn't like Tunisia. Tunisia is a pretty you know, sort of unique case in that people on both the Republican and Democratic sides of government support Tunisia, support its transition, want to see Tunisia succeed, but it's not a major priority for many people. And I will just say, you know, from my own time working in the um, U.S. government on Tunisia during the early years of the transition, you could always see that, you know, everyone loved Tunisia. There was so much interest in helping, wanting to help Tunisia achieve a successful democratic transition, but Tunisia was constantly being overshadowed by other U.S. interests in the region, whether it's Libya or Iran or Israel-Palestine. Anytime anything else would happen, Tunisia would kind of fall on the back burner, and that's really, you know, dangerous for U.S. support for Tunisia. If you need to be able to prioritize it and recognize that Tunisia is a country that should be on the front burner, not just a back burner. Um, We've seen Congress from Obama to Trump really kind of approach Tunisia the same way. So despite some of the Trump administration's attempts to significantly decrease U.S. aid to Tunisia, Congress has kind of pushed that back. So, for example, in the first President Trump's first budget proposal to Congress, he requested a two-thirds cut of Tunisia's aid. It was massive, but Congress squarely rejected that and has been regularly appropriating around $250 million a year. The one caveat to this is the most recent budget. So this budget has not yet been passed by uh, the full Congress, but for the um, FY21 budget, 
the House of Representatives has only recommended 191.4 million in total aid for Tunisia, which is about $50 million less than it has been receiving. That's something that's worth paying attention to. I don't think we should read into that as a sign that the US Congress doesn't support Tunisia or has sort of changed its position, but it shows that this is a really difficult time, not just for Tunisia, but for the United States as well. You know, the COVID crisis uh, has been ravaging the United States and really ravaged our own economy. And so I think that you know countries such as Tunisia, which again, have not been a priority, are going to be somewhat hurt by this. Now, what happens if we do see a Biden-Harris um, presidency? I think, again, we're not gonna see sort of a major shift in US policy towards Tunisia, but there are a couple of interesting changes that I think we would likely see. One is more vocal rhetorical and diplomatic support for promoting US values abroad. This is something that the Trump administration explicitly said they were not going to do. There's an interesting speech by um, former Secretary of State Rex Tillerson saying that values are not part of our policy, that we're just not even gonna to try to do this. And so I do think you would see a shift back towards what is a more kind of attempt at balancing US interests and US values, and certainly more vocal support for democracy, which would benefit Tunisia tremendously as a sole democracy in the MENA region. That would also likely come with more funding for civil society and political reform as opposed, not necessarily bigger pots of money, but sort of shifting resources around to hopefully address uh, and help some of the activists and some of the people working on reform efforts. And I also think one of the things we would see from a Biden administration is a return to multilateralism. So again, we've seen the Trump administration, you know, the America First policy really, you know, kind of pushing itself away from all these different multilateral organizations. I think if we were to see a Biden presidency, we would see the United States working more closely with our European allies in general, which means we could see more cooperation on issues like migration, on support for democratic change. And also I think you would probably see more interest in Libya and trying to sort of address the Libyan crisis in part because this all started when, uh, pres when Biden was vice president, uh, which I think that he will have some of a personal connection to this. And we could have some, some interest in trying to actually play a bigger US role in addressing that conflict, which could also have positive ramifications for Tunisia as we've talked about, and I'll leave it there. Well, uh, thank you very much, Sarah. We appreciate your uh, comments. Um, uh, I, I have uh, just a little time for some questions. Uh, we have quite a few. Um, uh, I, I'd like to, to start with a question to Rauda from uh, uh, our friend Sahar Khamis at the University of Maryland. Uh, she'd like to know what the social, uh, what the role of the social media change, has, has it changed the uh, role of social media in Tunisian sociopolitical landscape uh, today, uh, has it, uh, how has it changed compared to 2011? Uh, greatly. Uh, in the beginning, 2011, social media and played a great role, especially in uh, uh, rallying support and in organizing demonstrations. Uh, Tunisians are used, for example, Facebook heavily right now, but uh, not as much uh, as they used to. So people uh, have, uh, I think, invented uh, other ways of uh, political participation um, and social media are playing a lesser role in uh, political activism, uh, uh, much, much less than it used to be in uh, 2011. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, this question is a combination to uh, Larvi and to Daniel uh, on uh, the uh, issue of the Constitutional Court. Uh, uh, whether uh, Saeed will, will uh, really establish the Constitutional Court and uh, whether it will be uh, a good arbiter in the political system. Well, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, from the beginning of the transition, I, my, 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 my opinion is that the when they hammered out the Constitution, they should have defined the, the process for selecting a Supreme Court then. Instead, they left it up to an organic law, which was then passed and established a very a, a complicated a process. I won't even go into the details. Most Tunisians I know can't explain it anyway, uh, for selecting a 12-member a, a court. And, and, with, and the numbers itself could be problematic. Who breaks the stalemate? Uh, and um, it's not up to the president to, 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 to resolve this problem. He doesn't have it within his power to do that. This has been constantly obstructed because the process requires essentially a, a, a series of votes by various different bodies. And because all the parties believed 
or fear that the court could be powerful and make decisions that would not advantage them, they are really not interested in picking the Supreme Court. <laughs> so the stalemate around the Supreme Court reflects the, a, a desire not to, not to solve it because once you have a Supreme Court, there's just a raft of issues uh, from laws on the books to impending laws to the question of presidential versus parliamentary power that technically might be resolved by or addressed by the Supreme Court, although such a court, depending on whose members are in there, uh, could be stalemated too. So the Supreme Court is not necessarily a panacea, but it would be far better if they could arrive at one. But there's no obvious, you know, unless the president can sort of mobilize his own charisma to nudge the various participants to resolving this, and it's not impossible that he, he might do this, uh, providing in part if he would simply recognize or at least articulate some belief in the notion that the formal institutions of government actually are important other than the president himself. Um, he might, he might play that role, but he can't, but by, by, he can't legally or constitutionally resolve the problem. Right. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, uh, Sarah, a question for you. Uh, can you, uh, I don't know if this is probably putting you on the spot, but uh, I'm sure it may not. Uh, uh, can you identify the main champions for Tunisia and Tunisian aid within the U.S. Congress? Are there any specific people? Sure. So, Unfortunately, the main sort of advocate for Tunisia in Congress was John McCain. Um, after he passed away, that sort of left a vacuum of, of, there's not one particular person, but I will say that Mitt Romney, when he has, um, when he took over, he has uh, tried to pay more attention to Tunisia. Uh, Lindsey Graham has also been a big supporter of Tunisia, but really there was a big loss after Senator McCain passed away because he was really the main, the strongest voice in the US Congress in promoting Tunisia. Right, uh, one last question. This is uh, for Larbi or uh, for Rauda. Uh, uh, there has been a lot of, uh, this is from Abdul Hamid Siam. Uh, there has been a lot of Gulf money pouring into the, to, uh, uh, Tunisia actually to uh, fund political parties and uh, basically influence the democratic process. Uh, could you comment on that, please? We have heard so many rumors that uh, certain countries, uh, Gulf countries, especially the Emirates and uh, Qatar, are pouring, pouring money either to the Islamists or um, to the other uh, country, uh, political parties. It's very difficult, really, to admit this. We, we, we haven't had any real proof um, that uh, any of these countries are really uh, given money to certain political parties. Um, we have seen, I mean, political parties using money and the, there are so many Tunisians who feel that if you do not have, uh, if any political party doesn't have money, they cannot really uh, play their roles as political organizations. But again, it's very difficult just to assert or to, to admit or to deny that any country has uh, given money to any uh, political party. Uh, uh, this is this is a question to anybody who would like to uh, to answer it, or to more than one person. Uh, in general, how does one replace a dictatorship? How do we? What 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 is the principal uh, uh, step that Tunisians can now really go for establishing a good uh, democratic process? You can go there. Well, that's a, there's a three-day conference for you right there, maybe. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> support for that. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough question because the, the, the scenario that worries me most is that you have a president who does what other sort of presidents have done, and that is, in, in the face of a parliament which is fragmented and paralyzed, go to the people, get a referendum, change the order of the, the political order as established by the constitution, which is blurry in any case, and then use that to push an agenda that would, that would push Tunisia, at least implicitly, in a more authoritarian direction. That's disconcerting. What, what Tunisia, I think, and this is my personal opinion, needs uh, uh, is a, an actual uh, system in which there is a majority that, that has a, a coalition of parties that actually have a majority and an and actual opposition. And a, and, a, and a government that actually has authority to do things in the name of, of a majority. The problem is that, as Sarah noted, uh, uh, 
there isn't, if you look at the map, and I have it in front of me right here, there isn't an obvious way of cobbling out that, that majority. And it's not clear that new elections, which probably will happen, we won't simply reproduce uh, the same problem. Now, there are a, a, a number of uh, uh, um, proposals for changing some of the ways in which elections take place, such as raising the threshold from three to 5% to get into the parliament for parliamentary elections. I don't know if that wouldn't simply replicate the same problem anyway. So electoral engineering, which we love to do in DC, is not always the kind of panacea we imagine. Uh, so, you know, I just think it's a really, it's a really uh, a hard question, but I want to circle back very quickly, if I may, just to this question of outside interference, because it definitely has both helped exacerbate the internal uh, situation. You know, Qatar remains the, the second most, the second highest investor in Tunisia, direct investor. It has a lot of money in the hotel industry and so on. There are a lot of players in this picture, but I don't think ultimately, despite all the rumors, which are largely, as Professor Ahmad said, unproven, um, and despite the evidence, which I've written about, that the UAE and Saudi Arabia have tried to interfere, at least through the airways, right, as it were, uh, by, by essentially undercutting the Renouchi, I don't think ultimately these are the forces that will make the difference. Uh, this, this is a problem that Tunisians have to solve, and it's on their backs to do so. And however important it is to have American sport, which it is, and so on, it's up to Tunisians to, 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 to dig themselves out of this hole, which is very deep. And so far, they're not stepping up to the plate. Sarah? Thanks. I completely agree with Dan that you need some sort of majority and a, and a real opposition. But on top of that, I think in order to replace the dictatorship to actually move forward and fully consolidate democracy, you need participation. And one of the troubling signs, I think Rauda uh, referred to this, is that people are turning more away from formal politics to the street. A vibrant civil society is absolutely essential to a healthy democracy, but what you need is a balance. You need trust in politics. And so as people, unfortunately, the trust is declining. People are seeing the, the way to get things done is by going into the streets, by protesting, instead of forming political parties, supporting political parties, running for office, you need those two things working in concert with each other. Um, and then finally, I mean, one of the things that I think we, we often you know, forget is that this thing is only 10 years old. Um, and to sort of paraphrase the musical Hamilton, they say, you know, fighting a revolution is easy, governing is hard. And I think that that is, is absolutely clear. The sort of, the, what you need to do to, to win, to have a revolution, to sort of remove a dictator, those skills are not the same as governing. Those skills are not the same as forming coalition. And so these, you know, developing political parties, developing the sort of political skills and the participatory skills that are necessary in the long run, I think Tunisia will get there, but it's, it's only been 10 years. So I think we should also give Tunisia a little credit that they're, they're, they're moving forward, but maybe not as quickly as, as some people would like. And may I add something? Yeah, please, go right ahead. Yeah. I uh, remember being asked this question some time ago by some African uh, um, politicians. They were asking this question, is it better to ask a, a dictator or to convince the dictator to be more democratic? Uh, I think this happened maybe six or seven years ago. And my first reaction, of course, getting rid of the dictator is much better. Unfortunately, in Tunisia, we have learned that even when we, you get rid of the dictator, you have a, a, what we call the whole system uh, on. We have not been able uh, to invent a new discourse or a new metaphor or a new way of doing uh, things. And all the people who believe in a revolution in Tunisia, we, the thing that hurts us so much is that when we see the old regime um, people and figures looking at all of these young people telling, okay, you have tried freedom and you have seen that freedom is not enough or it's not the solution uh, uh, to uh, the problems. I think that the most, the biggest challenge to Tunisians right now is not to be free or to run elections. I think honestly to establish a discourse where new concepts and new metaphors become something normal and they can figure out a way. It's not a problem of finding an equivalent in Arabic. It's not a problem of finding a word that means to people. It's a problem of establishing all of these concepts that seem not to be resisted, but that have not yet found their way uh, to uh, every, uh, I mean, to the, ordinary people um, 
imaginary or uh, discourse. I remember myself attending so many of uh, the uh, uh, meetings for the, for the citizens in municipalities. And I was at the head of one of the committees and I was begging the uh, inhabitants of a, a local authority telling them, what, how, how do you dream of this place in 10 or 20 years? And none of them really had um, uh, given us any imagination. They just didn't find their voice yet. Building voice is so important. Trust is not playing uh, in our favor right now. However, but at the same time, uh, I don't think that Tunisians have found their voice yet. I think individuals as well as groups, they can hear each other, they can say whatever they like, but they have not found their voice yet. And the only way to replace a dictator and a dictatorship is to empower citizens and enable them through different experience to have uh, and to build a voice as individuals and as especially groups. And having these group voices is something which seems to be so challenging right now because Tunisians right now, they know what they hate. They know exactly that uh, they hate this, they hate that, they hate that, but they are totally and utterly unable to make a list of what they like. They cannot agree on national priorities, although it's very easy to agree on them. And different polls uh, have made it clear that people are against dictatorship. People are really longing for freedom. This is real. You feel it all over with the elite, with the ordinary um, Tunisians. And uh, they want dignity, they want uh, uh, employment, and uh, uh, I think we will find a way. And I totally and utterly agree with you, Sarah. And then it's our own problem. And I'm sure we will find a way somehow. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, yeah thank you. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's good to have the, uh, uh, the optimism here. Uh, you know, the, the political science in me uh, uh, is a scientist and uh, wants to add a couple things. Uh, number one, I mean, it's, it's, it's like, you know, I know this is positivist thinking and uh, this may have uh, already receded in political science, but if you don't have a, a, a stake in the system, if you don't have a stake in the economy, why would you participate politically? In other words, I mean, uh, does, does politics trump the economy or should the economy come first? I mean, what, what comes first? What do you think, Sarah? Well, I think it's, I mean, that's a really difficult question. And I think Tunisia made the choice to do politics first, which I don't think was the wrong choice, because right. if you don't have the institutions in place, you're not going to be able to actually make the decisions regarding the economy. But there was an economic cost to that, and that Tunisia is still paying for that. I don't think had they done it the other way around, that they, that they would have necessarily succeeded, because the, the change in the economy also takes a lot longer you can build institutions and all of that more quickly than you can actually address the deep-seated structural economic challenges. Right. Uh, Dan, I wanted to ask you to uh, uh, just simply, uh, you know, see yourself in, uh, the, the, in the next uh, parliamentary elections. Uh, uh, if they, I, I think you alluded to this, that maybe uh, the next will be, will have to have, uh, Tunisia will have to have new parliamentary elections to produce a new parliament. What do you see in that happening? I want to tell you I'm not running in this round. Uh, well, uh, you, you're, not, you're, not, you're, not, you're not allowed. I'm going to decline that. <laughs> but, you know, I, you know, my fear is that, um, that it's going to recreate the same sort of fragmented parliament. I don't see why it wouldn't. But the difference here would be, of course, that you, you, uh, Abir Musi's party would, be, would find it has as many, if not more, votes. And Nakta has 52 seats now. It could have more. Uh, and, uh, and, and this party, this is the only party, by the way, in the parliament that explicitly demands that enough to be made illegal and be thrown out of the system. Uh, she is a holdover from the previous regime. She's explicitly authoritarian uh, in, her, in her language and her goals. Uh, and that would really create the, the, the preconditions for any effort to do that. Whether you like enough or not, its inclusion is absolutely essential for maintaining democracy in, uh, in, in uh, Tunisia. And then I just want to add this quick point, uh, and, uh, and that is this issue of corruption is absolutely essential. 
um, and the current, the way the power sharing arrangement works adds to it because it's fueled by corruption. This, this kind of the system is, is only sustained by corruption, by payoffs. Um, and uh, so one reason why young people are so disillusioned, other than the fact that the political system seems to be theater itself, is there's enormous corruption in every, and it's only become worse and worse and worse. Um, and so uh, you, you get a situation where uh, you have the second largest party in the parliament, which is the heart of Tunis, which is run by a, a business medium uh, uh, millionaire, uh, Karui, who uh, essentially uh, has used his own funds to buy his way, it sounds very familiar, doesn't it, into the political arena. And Anaka, despite all its rhetoric against uh, uh, corruption, uh, has been trying to cut a deal with this man and this party all along. Um, so young people look at this and the Anaka's playing both sides uh, of the of the game by you know establishing its, its credentials as anti-corruption yet cutting deals with one of the leading corrupt parties in the whole arena and they say you know what is this it's meaningless it's 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 a fraud uh so yeah we need a government that has the power and authority to overcome this corruption because the current government has is now created and now is functioning only sustains and in fact emboldens more corruption can i just add one thing to that about the election. So I think one of the other reasons why new elections would be harmful is that we've seen a trend towards people voting for independence. So you've seen growing numbers of not even parties. So when you're talking about how do you form a coalition and you have 30, 50 people who don't even represent a party, that becomes really, really difficult. And I think because of all these things we've been talking about, the distrust of parties, the corruption, all of that, people rightly are turning to people who have no party affiliation to say, well, this guy, at least he's not going to be tied to one of these big things, but that makes governing really, really difficult. Right. Um, uh, this question is uh, for Rauda. Um, uh, this is an email question. What is the rate of women political participation in the region? <laughs> and what are the challenges facing female politicians now? Tunisian women enjoy a lot of uh, um, good laws that enable them to be um, represented and uh, to run uh, for uh, in different elections. However, if we look at the composition of uh, uh, the different parliaments uh, that we have elected uh, since 2011, we uh, see uh, the same polarization in uh, uh, the parliament that we live uh, uh, outside of it. And uh, even the percentage of uh, Tunisian women uh, uh, represented in parliament uh, has not increased uh, a lot. I mean, if we compare the percentage of women elected as parliamentarians in the Ben Ali government, because there was a quota system, and after the revolution, the increase was uh, from 23% to 34% in uh, the best uh, of uh, cases. I don't think that uh, uh, Tunisian women have been absent for, from the political arena on the country. Uh, Tunisian women have been especially very active in civil society and we have seen the Tunisian women in the streets, especially uh, in uh, drafting the constitution. And we have seen so many uh, CSOs, uh, women CSOs, as well as different groups being very active in making sure that the Tunisian constitution is uh, secular and is up to their uh, expectations. However, I think that both Tunisian uh, women as well as uh, men find it very difficult to uh, participate, fully participate in the political um, life in Tunisia due to the fragmentation of uh, parties and especially the polarization that we have been suffering from. I think that uh, increasing this and, and finding a solution to the weak uh, party uh, parties right now uh, is going to enhance the uh, women participation and especially increase the women voice in uh, uh, elected uh, uh, systems. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, uh, Dan, you have, a, uh, you have a question about the, uh, the general trade union uh, 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 and uh, whether it has any role in the current crisis. You know, we, we do know that they played a huge role a few years back, but uh, there hasn't been a whole lot of uh, uh, noise coming uh, out from, uh, from them today. Where, where are they today? And uh, how, are, how influential are they in the, the 
current political process. Uh, this question is from uh, Mongi Dawoodi, and uh, the, uh, Mongi also asked Sarah, um, uh, how, uh, you can't, uh, why can't the head of parliament in the semi-democratic, uh, semi-parliamentary system uh, really comment on foreign policy and the civil war raging in a neighboring country? Dan, you first. I think the trade union is extremely important and remains important. Uh, it's a trade union, the most independent trade union in North Africa. And it out of a country of 11 million people, nobody's exactly sure, but it probably has 500, 600,000 members. This is, and it can mobilize in the streets very quickly. And it can shut down the in industries like the phosphate industries in a minute if it calls upon its, its members to, 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 to strike. And a lot of that has been implicitly happening already, and has happened before. So it, uh, it, it, one of the interesting things is that one of the most organized uh, socioeconomic institutions in Tunisia doesn't have its influence reflected in the parliament as a party, but can it exercise tremendous influence on the ground and on its base. And it, the union is adamantly opposed to any kind of privatization or market reform and has tr tried as best as it can to block any kind of reform like that. And of course, the reforms come with all kinds of costs, understandably, that they don't want their, their, their rank and file to pay. Uh, but it's hard to see how, if you take the phosphates industry, which is at the heart of uh, Tunisia's economy, um, it's also a major producer of pollution. It's an environmental disaster for Tunisia. And it really needs to be reformed, not only because it it, 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 it's uh, in terms of the profit making, it's a losing industry in so many ways, but because it's environmentally a disaster. But it, the, the UGTT adamantly opposes uh, restructuring the phosphates industry because they don't want the, their members to lose jobs. So it's a very powerful player. And it's very good to echo what's been said before uh, by Professor Othman, it's very good at saying no, but it doesn't know how to negotiate a yes. It doesn't really know how to, to engage in a kind of dialogue in which the boundaries of an, of a, of an effective economic reform program would, would be defined and implemented. Sarah? Sure, so why, why, why can't yeah. Why can't Renouchi talk about Libya? So he certainly can talk about Libya. I think in a democracy, anyone you know can and should voice their opinion on policy. The issue that a lot of people, and President Said being one of them, had is that he traveled to Turkey um, you know, and which is, again, that clearly should have been discussed without consulting President Said, I should say, and that should have been discussed with President Said um, to advocate for a position that was different from the, pres the position of the president. And so what you're having is, you know, this, this fight. Um, and again, when it's, you know, stated in the Constitution that the that foreign affairs are the president's domain, the president can give that power to others, can certainly, you know, Prime Minister Shah had traveled all the time on behalf of Beji Khadisipsi, you know, but that was, this year was about consultation, it's about appearances, and they're in, because we're in this fractured nature that everyone is looking for little things to kind of ping each other with, but I think had Ghanoushi been advocating for a position that Said shared, he would have been fine with it. It's that he was doing this kind of behind Said's back, advocating for something that Said had not put forward as the official position of the country, and so that's where there was some, some problems. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, I know that uh, uh, this is, uh, Sarah, this is may maybe you can answer this question. Uh, uh, you know, Algeria is, uh, is right next door. Uh, you know, what, uh, I mean, do you, do you have any specific information about how Algeria is interested or uh, is involved or not involved in the Tunisian matter? My understanding of the sort of Tunisia-Algerian relationship since the um, transition has been taking place in Algeria is that things have mostly stayed the status quo. So one of the, I would say the most important uh, issue is security cooperation. And um, you know, Algeria is very much guards its sovereignty, does not have pretty much any <laughs> security cooperation agreements with anyone except for Tunisia. And so there is this very, very important relationship on the border between Tunisia and Algeria where both Tunisia and Algeria forces are working together 
um, to try to root out some of the violent extremists there. That has, from my understanding, has been functioning fully throughout all of the turmoil in Algeria. There have been no disruptions to that. And Algeria has not really weighed in on Tunisia. Um, President Said did visit Algeria. That was his first actually visit out of the country, which is important, and it's the next door neighbor. That makes sense. So I do think, you know, there's attempts at maintaining a strong relationship between the two countries, or as you know, strong as you can get with Algeria, but um, but nothing dramatically has shifted between either the turnover in Tunisia or Algeria. Uh, this this question is for anybody who would like to, to answer it. Uh, it's partly comment, partly a question uh, from uh, Ayman Basalih. Uh, basically, the idea that these forces, these political parties that emerged after Ben Ali, uh, like al Nahda and some, some others, uh, they represent themselves as revolutionary forces, but they actually have sought to establish relationships with uh, Ben Ali's dominant interest groups um, and the new the emergent ones. Uh, uh, that is also another factor to the statement the country is now witnessing, isn't it? Who's the answer, Imad? Oh, uh, anybody, anyone can start. Well, I would uh, just okay. say very quickly that, you know, while we use the term revolution, for, for Tunisia, it wasn't a revolution. It was a negotiated transition, which required incorporating elements of the Ancien regime into the into the political arena. So, right. you know, it wasn't, you know, the expectation of a revolution was, I don't think it was betrayed. I think it was simply replaced by what was a negotiated process in which the only way to move forward was to reassure the, the forces from the old regime that they had a place in the new arena. Otherwise, what kind of democracy could you have? I mean, you, you start by excluding. So, so I think that they've paid, you know, they paid a considerable cost for, for doing this, but I don't think that there was any other choice but to signal a readiness. And of course, the, the, the first president, Tunisia, in 2014, was, 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 was out of the old regime. Uh, so it's not, it's not, that is not an unusual thing, but it comes with a cost. Sarah? I don't have anything to add on that. Rauda? I don't think that we can consider another party like any other political party uh, that was established after the revolution because the Nahda has been underground since 1978. And uh, um, so many people are still allergic to a religious Islamist party in Tunisia, but uh, all Tunisians right now admit that Nada is a major political player, up to the point that actually so many people blame another for not being revolutionary enough, because unfortunately we still consider what happened is a revolution in Tunisia, and even the word Arabic in Arabic Thawra, it cannot be just uh, uh, translated into an uprising on anything else. So uh, I personally asked Rashid al-Ghanoushi in 2012, asking him, so many people uh, are uh, accusing you of recruiting the old uh, political party uh, people into your party because the RCD was the only political party, the ruling party of the dictatorship. And we have seen so many RCD personalities uh, moving to another. And he literally answered, these are our people that we sent to RCD in order to take over that party during the 1980s and 1990s. And this uh, story has been confirmed by so many uh, RCD uh, political leaders whom I asked personally. So this combination between the old regime and uh, the revolutionary people is so much uh, enrooted in the past. I don't think it is easy to make any kind of judgments. But at the same time, we do accuse, everybody accuses another of losing this revolutionary tone and of disappointing not only their uh, members, but also the Tunisians, because they have rushed into being accepted as a political, uh, as playing a, a major political role without securing this revolutionary tone that they were entrusted with, whether we like it or not. It is difficult not to entrust somebody who has spent 20 years of his life in prison just for um, advocating uh, political freedom or political participation. Uh, thank you, Rauda. Uh, I'd like to uh, bring this session to a close, but before I go, uh, uh, 
somebody just alerted me that Israel and the UAE have actually reached a historic deal uh, that will establish full diplomatic relations between the two Middle Eastern nations. Uh, and Israel would promise to uh, simply suspend applying sovereignty to the areas of the West Bank that it wanted to annex. So there you go. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the panelists. We really appreciate your participation today to, uh, today to enlighten us on uh, Tunisian affairs. Uh, we, uh, uh, we appreciate your, uh, your input and uh, thanks for the audience for uh, staying with us and uh, watching us and please stay with, the, uh, with uh, Arab Center uh, events and uh, productions uh, uh, at our website at uh, arabcenterdc.org. Thank you very much and have a very good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.